wanted to try something uh, a little bit different today. Um, I wanted to have you join me as I do some studying. For this video, I am I'm in a library, and so you're going to be hearing ambient noises of people talking and uh, moving around and shuffling books around and I hope it won't be too disruptive. Uh, I would prefer to do this in silence, but uh, my if, if I tried to do it at home, we would be constantly interrupted with sounds of cars going by and I thought maybe the ambient sounds of a library might be a little more um, a little more soothing. Okay, so to introduce this, I am uh, I'm not an academic by any means. I finished college uh, a few years ago, and um, I'm just not I'm not involved in uh, the academic uh, scene, I guess. But I do try to supplement my knowledge, um, continuing to maintain uh, the knowledge I do have with uh, things like scientific papers. And um, I will find one that seems interesting and uh, try to go through it. And sometimes, Sometimes it's easier to understand than others. Sometimes they're very, very specialized to the extent that I can't really grasp what they're trying to communicate. Uh, like this one, for instance. Oh my goodness, this one was um, difficult to get through. Uh, so, um, so I might, I, I might do the same thing with scientific papers. Um, however, today I wanted to try getting into this uh, with you guys. This is a book I picked up, uh, The Ethics of Ambiguity, and I was, I was at a used bookstore, and um, I saw the title, and I just loved the title. Um, I have no idea who Simone de Beauvoir is. Uh, uh, she's a philosopher, uh, a woman, um, a French woman, and this book is translated from French. Um, there's a picture of her. Uh, and so for this one I didn't I didn't uh, do any background research. I uh, it's one of those things that I just wanted to pick up and see what it said to me without um, getting uh, primed for it, I suppose. Um, which is arguably not good. Uh, academic practice or scholarly practice, but, uh, but you know, like, and it, it's the same thing with the scientific papers. But I, I like that method of exploring what's available out in the world and uh, seeing what it says to me, whether I misinterpret it or not. Uh, and so. Um, I wanted to start going through this book with you and see how it goes um, using my own method of interpreting and taking notes and I usually have to do a lot of uh, rereading. Like I'll read a sentence and I won't understand it so I just have to read it until I get what, they're, what it's trying to say. and. Uh, I will, I'm sure I'm going to have to look a lot of things up, which is where the library comes in handy. So, uh, if you'd like to join me with that, then welcome, and uh, let's get started. Um, yeah, I, I'm not even sure exactly what time period this is. This says it's copyright 1948, but not by... Simone de Beauvoir. Instead, it's by the Philosophical Library, so I don't know if they own the copyright for a reprinting. I, I just I know nothing, so that's kind of that's where we're that's where we're going to start. The introductory quote here is: 
life in itself is neither good nor evil. It is the place of good and evil, according to what you make it. That's by uh, Montaigne said that. You can definitely get behind that. Uh, you can see that uh, the previous owner of this book uh, marked up this copy, uh, which is fine. Um, I'm going to need to take notes as well. Um, I'm going to be doing it in a separate notebook, though. Oh, and I apologize about the camera angle. I did not... I, I failed to bring the necessary equipment for a top-down view, and I'm very, very sorry about that, but I... I feel like if I put this off, it won't happen, so that's, I'm just, I'm just gonna do with it, and if I do another video like this, I'll, uh, I'll bring a, I'll bring a better setup. Okay, so this is, uh, and freedom. The continuous work of our life, says Montaigne, is to build death. He quotes the Latin poets, prima que vitam dedit, hora corpset, and, uh, and again, nascentes morimur, and uh, I'm definitely gonna have to uh, look something up already, that was fast. So I'm gonna make a little footnote and come over here and write down uh, what I find out, so I'll need to look up the Latin. And, um, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right either, but, uh, that's, um, probably no one knows how to pronounce it anyway, so that's fine. Alright, what was it? Uh, prima. Prima. Okay. Qu uh, qu qu qua. Prima. Qua. Maybe it was qua. Eight. Um, Cicero says that to study philosophy is nothing but to prepare oneself to die. I'm not sure that any preparation is required. Okay, uh, it says it's from Seneca, and it means the hour which gives us life begins to take it away. of this world, of which he is a consciousness. 
He asserts himself as a pure internality against which no external power can take hold. And he also experiences himself as a thing crushed by the dark weight of other things. At every moment he can grasp the non-temporal truth of his existence. But between the past, which no longer is, and the future, which is not yet, this moment when he exists is nothing. privilege, which he alone possesses, of being a sovereign and unique subject amidst a universe of objects, is what he shares with all his fellow men. In turn, an object for others, he has nothing more than an individual in the collectivity on which he depends. So I think basically what's being described here is sort of the human condition, the, the self-awareness of humanity we can know things about ourselves, know we're going to die, we can observe our own experience, we can observe our internal experience, and everything external to us is an object, it is something we cannot see into, and which presumably cannot see into us. As long as there have been men, and they have lived, they have all felt this tragic ambiguity of their condition. But as long as there have been philosophers, and they have thought, most of them have tried to mask it. They have striven to reduce mind to matter, or to reabsorb matter into mind, or to merge them within a single substance. So, she's asserting that philosophy up to this point has tried to cover up the true state of the human mind or the human soul. By a sort of reductive process. It's an interesting claim. Those who have accepted the dualism have established a hierarchy between body and soul which permits of considering as negligible the part of the self which cannot be saved. Okay, so the part of the self which cannot be saved after death is considered negligible, it's considered uh, meaningless or inconsequential under this framework of a hierarchy between body and soul. I think she's still discussing these previous philosophers that either say that the internal mind is part of the material world, or to say that the material world is just part of mind, of the internal subjective world. Or to merge them together and say that they're the same thing. And so, working within that sort of duality, she's saying that they're saying that anything that does not last after death is negligible. They have denied death, either by integrating it with life, or by promising to man immortality. Or, again, they have denied life considering it as a veil of illusion beneath which is hidden the truth of nirvana. And the ethics which they have proposed to their disciples has always pursued the same goal. It has been a matter of eliminating the ambiguity by making oneself pure inwardness or pure externality, by escaping from the sensible world or by being engulfed in it, by yielding to eternity or enclosing oneself in the pure moment. Sounds like she's sort of describing um, a, few a couple different versions of Western and Eastern thought uh, about the nature of mind and the soul. There are 
some views that posit that everything about the physical world is entirely an illusion, and the only thing that there is is spirit, and so anything that happens or seems to happen in the physical world is just a is an elaborate deception by our senses, and so to find a truth we must reject our senses. And then on the other hand, there is materialism, which simply asserts that there's no such thing as a soul, there's no such thing as subjectivity, there's no such thing as anything beyond the physical world, and that our own perception and our own experience of consciousness is a... Um, a trick played by our brain, essentially, um, in order to allow us to operate. Uh, and then there's, of course, um, more Western thought, which basically says that the, uh, the soul is infused into a human, and then when the body dies, the spirit continues on as part of a spiritual hierarchy little structure that will allow certain souls to continue after death and certain souls not to. Uh, let's see, let's have her continue. Uh, Hegel, with more ingenuity, tried to reject none of the aspects of man's condition and to reconcile them all. According to his system, the moment is preserved in the development of time. Nature asserts itself in the face of spirit, which denies it while assuming it. The individual is again found in the collectivity within which he is lost, and each man's death is fulfilled by being cancelled out into the life of mankind. One can thus repose in a marvelous optimism, where even the bloody wars simply express the fertile restlessness of the spirit know much about Hegel, so, um, at this point, uh, I mean, what the author is doing here is describing other modes of thought and other ideas than her own, because it sounds like she's getting, getting prepped to disagree with them, which, which is fine and which is good. Disagreement is only valuable if you know what you are disagreeing with. Anyway, to continue. At the present time, there still exist many doctrines which choose to leave in the shadow certain troubling aspects of a too complex situation, but their attempt to lie to us is in vain. Cowardice doesn't pay. Those reasonable metaphysics, those consoling ethics with which they would like to entice us, only extends only accentuate the disorder from which we suffer. Men of today seem to feel more acutely than ever the paradox of their condition. They know themselves to be the supreme end to which all action should be subordinated. But the exigencies of action force them to treat one another as instruments or obstacles, as means. I don't crushed by uncontrollable forces. Though they are masters of the atomic bomb, yet it is created only to destroy them. Each one has the incomparable taste of his mouth in his own life, and yet each feels himself more insignificant than an insect within the immense collectivity whose limits are one with the Earth's. It's beautiful. 
Perhaps in no other age have they manifested their grandeur more brilliantly, and in no other age has this grandeur been so horribly flouted. In spite of so many stubborn lies, at every moment, at every opportunity, the truth comes to light, the truth of life and death, of my solitude and my bond with the world, of my freedom and my servitude, of the insignificance and the sovereign importance of each man and all men. I'm just I'm getting the feeling of uh, just a lot of passion from her. Uh, the way she describes the human collective is, uh, is a strikingly beautiful. I, uh, I don't I don't have ways of describing it so well. The, there are conflicts between the individual and the mass collective and the various pressures that we exert on each other. I like the way she talks about it. There was Stalingrad and there was Buchenwald, and neither of the two wipes out the other. Since we do not succeed in fleeing it, let us therefore try to look the truth in the face. Let us try to assume, assume our fundamental ambiguity. It is in the knowledge of the gen genuine conditions of our life that we must draw our strength to live and our reason for acting. So here, uh, I'm going to need to do a little bit more research again because I don't know what she means by Stalingrad and Buchenwald and how they both exist without nullifying the other. I don't know what that means. So I will, uh, I'm going to look that up. battle on the Eastern Front of World War II, in which Nazi Germany and its allies fought the Soviet Union for control of the city of Stalingrad in southern Russia. Uh, and that happened between 1942 and 1943. Uh, the Nazi army bombed the Soviet city of Stalingrad, launching one of the bloodiest battles in history. Eventually, the Germans surrendered. A bloody, vicious battle. Uh, okay, Buchenwald was a German Nazi concentration camp. Uh, let's see. It was one of the largest. of survivors of that concentration camp. Let's see, the Buchenwald concentration camp was liberated on April 11th, 1945, but before the Americans arrived, the camp had already been taken over by communist prisoners who had killed some of the guards and forced the rest of the guards to flee. information. Um, I think perhaps she's saying that these horrific crimes committed by humans upon other humans exist. Like, that's a, that's a real thing. And instead of running away from that truth, we should look 
look it in the face and try to understand it from with the, with the most complete framework that we can. From the very beginning, existentialism defined itself as a philosophy of ambiguity. It was by affirming the irreducible character of ambiguity that Kierkegaard opposed himself to Hegel. And it is by ambiguity that, in our own generation, Sartre, 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 in being and nothingness, fundamentally defined man, that being whose being is not to be subjectivity which realizes itself only as a presence in the world, that engaged freedom, that surging of the for oneself which is immediately given for others. Uh, I have a, um, I feel like I have a good abstract understanding of what existentialism is what it says, but since she's making um, uh, historical and scholar scholarly references here, I want to look it up to make sure that, uh, that I'm working from the same definition that she is. Individual central to their thought. Okay, so it's about the individual. It claims that our own existence as unique individuals in concrete situations cannot be grasped adequately in theories and scientific systems that treat all particulars as members of a genus or instances of universal laws. They talk about the self as an existing individual, understood as an agent. Let's see. They hold that humans have no pre-given purpose or essence laid out for them by God or nature. It is up to each one of us to decide who and what we are through our own actions. What this means is that we, let's see, as Arthur said, existence precedes essence which means that we first simply exist, we find ourselves born into a world not of our own choosing, and then it is up to each of us to define our own identity or essential characteristics in the course of what we do in living out our lives. Thus our essence, our set of defining traits, is chosen, not given. Let's see how people decide their own fates, uh, existentialists are concerned with identifying the most authentic and fulfilling way of life possible for individuals. Um, and then there's just pages and pages and pages and pages. Uh, but the next section is existential ethics. So since we're reading an ethics book of some kind, I'll see what that says. Uh, See, it's a radical doctrine of individual freedom and responsibility. Okay, there's, it says that there's uh, three claims. Moral values are created rather than discovered. 
moral responsibility is more extensive than usually assumed, and moral life should not be a matter of following rules. seems to be uh, in line with my personal uh, thoughts and feelings so far. Uh, a, lot, a few different philosophies do that, so I, I'm sure that, that many could be integrated with, with others, as long as they're not dogmatic. Okay, uh, this one talks about Kierkegaard. Um, he was a Christian. And he talks about religion, he talks about the life of faith. Humans cannot achieve religious truth on their own. Um, okay, all right. I think I've, I've seen enough. Uh, okay, let's see. But it is also claimed that existentialism is a philosophy of the absurd and of despair. It encloses man in a sterile anguish and an empty subjectivity. It is incapable of furnishing him with any principle for making choices. Let him do as he pleases. In any case, the game is lost. Does not Sartre declare, in effect, that man is a useless passion? That he tries in vain to realize the synthesis of the for oneself and the in oneself to make himself God? It is true. But it is also true that the most optimistic ethics have all begun by emphasizing the element of failure involved in the condition of man. Without failure, no ethics. For a being who, from the very start, would be an exact coincidence with himself, in a perfect plentitude, the notion of having to be would have no meaning. Okay, there's, there's two parts there. Two thoughts here. So one of them is that uh, existentialism is a philosophy of the absurd and of despair. And, and yeah, because it says that there's no purpose in human life. There's no uh, pre predefined goal or values or morals or judgment. There's uh, there's just what the individual creates for himself. And I suppose it's traditional for people to find that somewhat um, a source of despair, I suppose, but I, I certainly don't. Uh, and, then, and then goes on to talk about um, how the, the, the element of failure is the foundation of ethics. And that makes a lot of sense, actually, because if, if we are at entire peace with all of our actions, then there's no such thing as ethical or non-ethical conduct. And she's obviously going somewhere with this, so I'll continue. Uh, one does not offer an ethics to a god. It is impossible to propose any to man if one defines him as nature, as something given. The so-called psychological or empirical ethics manage to establish themselves only by introducing surreptitiously some flaw within the man-thing which they have first defined. Hegel tells us, in the last part of the Phenomenology of Mind, that moral consciousness can exist only to the extent that there is disagreement between nature and morality. It would disappear if the ethical law became the natural law, to such an extent that by a paradoxical displacement, if moral action is the absolute goal, the absolute goal is also that moral action may not be present. Yeah. This means that there can be a having to be only for a being who, according to the existentialist definition, questions himself in his being, a being who is at a distance from himself and who has to be his being. Um, some of that is some... I, I, that's kind of clumsy wording. Um, remember, this is a translation, so perhaps in the French it's, uh, it's a graceful and elegant uh, way of saying it. Uh, when she says um, having to be, I think she means um, an ethical compuls compulsion or directive. And the last part, a being who is at a distance from himself and who has to be his being. I feel like a better way to say that would be um, 
a being who must be themselves, who cannot be something other than themselves. This is not so much a chapter as a just a, like a, like a section, like a segment of the book, um, and maybe maybe this is as good a stopping point as we're gonna get. Uh, I feel like this is a good start. I also feel like it's getting really noisy in the library here. Um, maybe I should find a different time to come. Anyway, I think this is a good start and. Let me know if you liked it, or if you if you would like to see this, and would continue to like to see this sort of stuff. And definitely let me know if I got something wrong, or made a mistake, or misinterpreted something. I, um, I, I I'm definitely an amateur at this, uh, so I would definitely welcome your input. Alright, uh, thank you for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you next time.